right over, we're going to get into the uh, second part of uh, self-esteem, and I hope that I hope that you've had time to uh, kind of digest uh, a number of the things that we said last week in these studies. But uh, uh, the the part about self-esteem and and uh, there's just a, a great deal that could go into that. I, c I could do a whole I could do a whole 15, 16 sessions on just nothing but but that. Uh, but it's uh, it's something you know we'll, we'll kind of go on with it tonight. Hope that you can get enough. Uh, I said a long time ago I never did teach at all, but I hope that uh, I can teach enough to cause you to itch and then you got a scratch. And uh, when you get that when you get that book out and start to scratch through the scriptures, you'll find things that you didn't know were there. Amen? <clears throat> All right, we're going to... Uh, uh, How to Love Them is the, uh, is the topic that we're looking at. And our course goal, uh, quite simply, is to learn how to truly love all. By the way, that's all caps how to love all others in accordance with scriptural command given in God's word by Jesus himself. And our verses, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. Three times he tells us to love one another. Amen? <coughs> Session goal before uh, last week and this week is to come to a proper self evaluation. Not looking at, don't look at others. Look at look at self. Uh, that that'd be a real change for a lot of folks. Uh, er, everybody usually uh, look. I heard an uh, old preacher one time say, you know, when you're pointing at somebody else, you got three more pointing back at you. So you got to be kind of kind of noticing on that. But a, a proper self evaluation. <coughs> now there's a lot of self evaluating goes on, but a proper one is is the one we're looking for. Uh, a self evaluation of our personhood and self worth, and to understand how this affects our evaluation and treatment of others. <coughs> now in this session we're going to get in and talk about self esteem, uh, and and the the latter part of it and. To self-esteem, the word esteem means to rate or to judge. To rate. In other words, uh, we don't compare ourselves with ourselves. Paul tells us not to do that. That's not a good thing. But when we begin to rate ourselves, we, we, uh, a lot of people often have the thing of, well, I'm better than them. You know? And uh, <clears throat> a lot of people, well, here's the one I've always heard. Too many hypocrites in the church. Y'all hear that? Yeah. Okay. So since there's a hypocrite in the church, how, is there hypocrites in other things too? Like, I don't know, auto mechanics and construction people and uh, uh. You see? Uh, and, and so I'm just going to get rid of my car and walk everywhere I go or buy me a horse because, you know, there's too many hypocrites in the garage. Okay. <clears throat> so that don't quite work. But to rate or to judge. Now the way we rate ourselves is like this. What God intended me to be versus what I am. Did you catch that one? What God intended for me to be and what I am. Uh, by the way, that's the way we're going to be judged one of these times when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, he's not going to judge me according to Apostle Paul or somebody else or or one of you folks or whatever. He's going to take what I am and compare it to what I could have been. What he intended for me to be. Think about that. That, that, that puts chills on you, okay? And uh, our belief system has a lot to do with our self-esteem. When we begin rating ourselves... Uh, if there's certain belief systems that we have, 
they'll cause us, even though we may be as wrong as two left shoes, it'll, it'll cause us to rate ourselves higher. Okay? And uh, so we, got, we want to watch on that. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about problems of high self-esteem. I think the problems of high self-esteem, uh, they're inherent and, uh, you know, they're very evident. They don't need a lot of study, but it does help us and it's beneficial to remind ourselves of some scriptures concerning uh, a high self-esteem. <coughs> now, excuse my throat. <coughs> and that's C-O-P-D, not C-O-V-I-D, so don't, don't get alarmed. <coughs> Proverbs 16, verse 18 and 19. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Okay? Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Haughty is high. That's a word, uh, that's an interesting little word in Hebrew, but it means up to, to in other words, you got a high attitude. You ever seen folks, you know, they just, they're high. Well, the old saying used to have, boy, I'll tell you what, he thinks he's high and mighty. Huh? Or the high, that high, that's what the word haughty means. Uh, a haughty spirit. Uh, before a fall, better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Better to be of an humble spirit, okay? Proverbs 25, 27, and 28, <clears throat> it is not good to eat much honey. Now, wait a minute, what, how are we getting into the dietary things here? Uh, you know honey is good for you? <clears throat> Uh, our, our Judy always has her, uh, she always, she'll get a big bottle like so, you know, of that local honey. And uh, I, I can eat some, but I can't, I can't eat a whole lot. But honey is good and wholesome. But, you know, honey uh, works on a, a lot of things, and honey works on some of cleansing the blood. Honey is a good agent for cleansing the blood. Uh, sometimes it'll cleanse it too good. <clears throat> I remember one time robbing bees, and I stay away from that. Listen, a bee will fly from here to Leesburg just to get sting me, and uh, and I can't handle the stings. I, I, I uh, uh, and uh, bad bad business with them. But uh, my wife's grandma, she just go out and take the top of the hive off and go to work, and I'm in bees light all over, and she didn't pay attention to them. Never did sting her. I don't know. Maybe she was prettier than me. I don't know what the deal was. But, <clears throat> but uh, they were robbing bees, and uh, an old boy on the holler come along, and they wanted a piece of honeycomb. They gave him a piece. Well, he ate that, and he wanted another piece. Then another piece. And they told him, said, you're eating too much of that. Now, you're welcome to it, but you can't eat that much of that. And he ate way too much. And uh, boil came up on him in different places where that, that was putting the stuff out of his blood. And, of course, it comes out through your hide if you can't get out no other way. And uh, so, but now here's the thing. It is not good to eat much honey. So, and when you say so, it's the same idea. And uh, in the same manner, you might say, it's not a good idea for men to search their own glory. Not a good idea for men to search their own glory. So to search their own glory is not glory. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Now, in the days of Bible, uh, and in the days this scripture was written, a city without walls wasn't going to last very long. Just not going to last very long. <clears throat> Proverbs 26, 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? The the word for conceit there uh, in the Hebrew is a word that means, it's actually a word that means the eye. And uh, in, in context, it means uh, in his own sight, in his own eyesight. Uh, it can mean eye or sight. And so seest thou a man wise in his own sight, his own conceit, his own uh, looking at his own self. There is more hope of a fool than of him. Wow. And by the way, a fool is a very serious thing in Scripture. <clears throat> Moving to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who maketh thee? Who makes you different from other people? Who makes you different from someone else? And what 
hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? All good things come down from the Father of lights. Amen? And, and so, whatever we have or whatever, however we differ from another does not come from within our own selves. It comes from, uh, all good things come from God. And so that means all bad things don't come from God. You know, today... <clears throat> I hear so many people, they blame God for everything that goes wrong, and, and they never give Him credit for anything that goes right. I mean, have you ever noticed that? I've, all through my life, I've noticed that, you know? And uh, so God gets the blame for a lot of things, and no credit. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And lest, Paul writing, he said, And lest I be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation. Christ spoke directly with Apostle Paul and showed him, taught him for three years uh, the things that, uh, you know, that, that Paul is going to later write uh, in the New Testament, the preaching that he's going to do. And, and he said, lest I should be exalted above measure, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. That's, that's a a fray, a thorn in the flesh, and uh, it's a it's a long word in in the Greek, but but it's got the meaning of a couple of words in it. There was given me a thorn in the flesh. Watch this, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So. Uh, he, he was never exalted above measure. He was always humble, and, and, and uh, except when somebody was way off the doctrine and he could get pretty, pretty steady, uh, hold a steady course in that. But he had the thorn in the flesh. Now, a lot of folks have the thorn in the flesh. That, that could be a, any number of things. Uh, a lot of folks think, and I, you know, I kind of lean that I don't know because the book don't say but uh, his eyes, he had an eye disease. And uh, I've seen people in other countries with the type of disease uh, that it causes their eyes to bulge out. I mean, really bulge out, and they're, they're red, and man, they, they're ugly, okay? It's an ugly thing. And, uh, and you remember one time he said, you would have even plucked your eyes out and given them to me. And, and so, you know, a lot of folks think that might have been... Uh, his his looks. Well, anyway, whatever it was, he prayed three times for God to take it away, and God told him, "My grace is sufficient." So get up and get on with it. All right, Luke eighteen and verse eleven. I love this. <clears throat> the Pharisee, the Pharisee, stood and prayed thus with himself: "God, I thank you, I'm not like that bunch. Not something. No, wait a minute." Say, God, I thank thee I'm not as other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this publican. Now, if I, if I recollect, I think the, the, the man, the Pharisee, I think his prayer, a total of, uh, you know, he talks about he fasts so much and he pays tithe. And I think he's, uh, I, I think 57 words, if I counted correctly, in the English. And then... Uh, there's the old fella over there who has a seven-word prayer. Smote upon his breast, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Went down to his house more justified than the other man. Amen? So, uh, you know, the, and one Greek text leads like this, and, and before I even found it, I, I'm thinking to myself, it says here that uh, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Hmm. But one Greek text actually says the Pharisee standing these things to himself prayed. Well, there's one thing about it. He sure wasn't praying to God, was he? Uh, I, I think sometimes a lot of prayers that people pray, they're, 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 they're really not to God. You, your prayers that do not have that humility... Even there's times, <clears throat> there's times that I have to just stop and 
struggling in prayer. Struggling. Of course, you always struggle in prayer. You do, everybody else does, so don't feel too bad about it. But you're struggling in prayer, and there's times I just stop. I shut my mouth, and, it, and then I, I pray, Holy Spirit, take off, take over. I've got an advocate at the right hand of God the Father, Jesus Christ, and I've got the Holy Spirit, and in Romans chapter 8 it says that the Spirit will make uh, those intercessions for us. Because we don't know how to pray as we ought. I, I don't know. So many people tell me, I want you to pray that God will do this or do that. I'm like, that's, uh, but that's above my pay grade. I, I'm not in the business of telling God what to do. Okay? And uh, uh, I can plead with God for certain things, but I, I always want it to be in His will. Father, if there's any way within your will that, that this could be and, and still the purpose be accomplished. But sometimes we get too, too out there in our praying and we start telling God what to do instead of, instead of praying uh, to God. Now, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3. Here's a good one. If a man think of himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. He deceiveth himself. A lot of times, I know a lot of people that have deceived themselves as to their esteem, and uh, but they ain't deceived nobody else. Okay? They're the only one uh, that believes what they're wanting folks to believe. Now, if a man thinketh himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. And another good one, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. <coughs> Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Vain glory. A, a Greek word that means empty glorying. Empty glorying. It, it's a, a self conceit in one's own eyes. In other words, uh, you're, not to, you're not to try to build yourself. You be humble and take the low place and let God lift you up. And, and, uh, this is one of the things that we need to learn. This has all got to do with this self-esteem thing. You think about it. Romans 12, verse 3. I love this one. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, an interesting note in this verse, we, we have the word think three times, okay? Three times we get the word think there. Uh, the first one, uh, I, say, I say through the grace given unto me that every man is among you not to think more highly. The first one uh, is, a, is a word that means... It, it's different than the next two Greek words that are translated the same thing. Okay, we've got think three times, but it's a different word in the first occurrence up there. And it's a word that takes the meaning of over-esteeming, over, you know, of, of thinking too highly of yourself once again, going right back to that same thing. The next two uh, uh, occurrences talk about to esteem or to consider or to rate or to judge. But that first one is to over-esteem or to be arrogant. To be arrogant. And uh, that's, that's what's being said in that verse. And, you know, it, it could have been translated a little differently, I guess, but most, uh, most uh, English translations put it the same way. Now, proper self-esteem. We've got all these verses now. Now, proper self-esteem. When we think about proper self-esteem, we want to be honest and proper. It's not going to be proper self-esteem if it ain't honest. That'd be a good place to throw an amen in. You may not get another chance. <laughs> it, it can't be, it cannot at all be proper if it's not honest. Folks, we need to be honest with our own selves. We need to be honest with our own selves. 
Now, it's somewhere near, if not totally, impossible. Uh, for a person who does not have a right relationship with Jesus Christ to have a proper self-estimate. If an individual don't know Jesus Christ, does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, is not saved, and, and is not in God's will, and, and you know, living uh, as best they know how to live for, for God, uh, it's almost, it, it may be impossible. I, I'm not going to, I don't like to say impossible, but boy, I can get real close to it uh, on that one. Now, I know that statement raises eyebrows in a lot of circles, but you think about it for a moment. The underlying dynamic for correcting self-esteem problem is to experience something. Unconditional love. Now, we say that phrase, and we don't really stop to think what it really is. And I'm, we're not talking about God just yet. Unconditional love. I did things growing up. I used to be known as the meanest, youngest, mischievous might be another word, but on the holler where I live. I mean, when, when folks heard that I got saved, everybody was laughing. I got saved when I was 17. And, and, and folks were there. Because from the time I was a little bit, I was into every people. Some of the things that me and my buddy Kathy would do was just absolutely beyond. And <clears throat> But you know what? My mommy would get a switch and wear me out once in a while. She didn't. She never gave me too much, though. So. Because first lick, oh, oh, God, oh, God. You know, you start screaming and hollering. Mommy thinks she's killing you. And mothers have that tender spot. Okay? Now, now, Daddy didn't, never did have to give me too many. But when he gave me one, it, you could squall, holler, do it. He had a dose measured out. And the dose he had measured out is what you was aiming to get. Okay? I don't, I don't care. You could squall, holler. <clears throat> I remember one time he was whipping me with a leather belt and out in the middle of the road and uh, I, I'd gotten I'd gotten an old man's cornfield and stole some corn. It was just nubbins. They wasn't even no corn on it yet. A little bit better. I might have been six. I must have been seven, eight years old. But anyway, he was whooping me and I was running. Well, he didn't have as much space to cover. He he was whooping and I was running. Okay? And he didn't quit till he got done. <laughs> <clears throat> and so the, that underlying dynamic is to have unconditional. He still loved me. He still loved me. And and so many things I do. I remember one time he built a uh, his old garage where he worked on his trucks burned down. It was an old wood frame garage. <clears throat> it burned down and uh, had an a air compressor, I think, start a fire in. But it, it burned down and, and he had one built back at the cinder block. You know, cinder block. So better better structure and we had an old 59 Chevrolet station wagon and uh, I'd get out and I'd move the car around you know and I'd drive an old truck around or something other this way and that way and uh, and I backed that car up through there and it, I guess it was a little longer than I thought it was and I hit one side of the big doors to that drive busted that cinder block from the bottom all the way to the top, just a big crack went up to it. Well, I figured he'd kill me, but he didn't. Uh, he did give me the dose that he had measured out. All right? <clears throat> now, where can you find unconditional love in this world that we live in? In this world system that we're in, where are you going to find unconditional love? love. Man, it's hard to come by. It's hard, I mean, it is hard to come by. And, uh, <clears throat> but unconditional love, it's what makes a marriage. It's what makes a marriage, amen? Amen. I mean, you know, Judy, she'd, she'd go on and on and on and on, and I'd still go deer hunting. And I'd always bring her something nice back, you know, when I came back. Uh, Four or five days later, I'd come back home. I'd have her a nice little gift or some kind of stop and gift. And uh, 
we were shopping in a little place one day and they had some of that old iron cast iron cookware oh, we had to come back home anyhow look man here look at this boy what a skillet look at that that thing is nice i said listen I, i'm taking in a piece offering and i don't know exactly how it's going to go it ain't going to be cast iron okay <laughs> i can promise you that right now cast iron not on, not on my list uh, so, so in the present world system, we're going to find unconditional love. And in case you've forgotten what unconditional love is, it's loving you not because you're intelligent, not because you're attractive, not because you perform well. See, that's the thing that makes that that the world demands of people. You, uh, you know, we we talked about that last week. You've got to be either intelligent, attractive, or both. If you're both. You're in good shape. Now, and, and perform well. You know, a lot of people think of you as to your performance. Your performance. And uh, and that that's just the way folks think. And it's not because you perform well. It's simply being loved because you are you. My mom lived to be 90, about 90 years old. A little over 90. And... Uh, I don't know, I don't know what kept her from being driven insane when I was young. I, I think back over those times and, and man, I was, I just absolutely, I was a little terror. And, uh, but she still loved me. And my daddy still loved me. And, and there was a love there. Uh, uh, an unconditional love. They loved me because I was who I was. They didn't love me because of what I did. Okay? And uh, I remember one time I, I took two 20-foot chains. We, we didn't have a road up to our house at that time. Didn't get a road till I was 10 years old. But uh, had would come up through the creek, you know, in, uh, if you didn't have a big washout or something, then you had to move all the boulders. But anyway... They, we come up through the creek, and when you got to our house, you drive up out of the creek up onto a flat spot. And my daddy, I drove an old truck, uh, old ton and a half Chevrolet truck to work, and he would turn around, he would back that truck up against a great big gate post, big old post about so big. And well, I got there one day, I <clears throat> got me two 20-foot chains out of the garage. A lot of work for a little boy like me to handle drag them chains around. But I got up under that truck. <coughs> I don't know where I got this idea. Got, I think it was because maybe Daddy took me to a movie and I seen it, I don't know. But then I got up under that truck and I put one of them chains around the rear end, the whole differential. And I piled that chain up and I hooked the other chain to it and I took the other end of that chain and I put it around that big gate pipe. I went up on the mountain not to pray. <laughs> I went up on the mountain and hid in a thicket and waited for Daddy to go to work. He was working second shift. And Daddy come out, got in that truck, and started it up and drove down into the creek. And about the time it leveled off, no more chain. Up and then down in the creek and the door flew open and he rolled out. Loosened a couple of his teeth, bit his pipe stem in two, had a bloody mouth. And when he got out of the truck, first thing he did was walk back there and look down there. He said, where is he? I'm going to kill him. Didn't even have to ask, wonder who did that, you know. And then I was in torment because he, he went on to, to work. And, and I was in torment. And I, I come in, and I went to bed, and I knew when he came home, and I heard his old truck come in, and I got under that cover, and I sound sleep, you know. I done worried about as much as sick, and he came in, and I heard my mommy saying, "Now wait him, now wait him. He's 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 done. Now he's he's asleep." Huh? Came in, got me out of the bed, gave me the dose. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but that was it. He still loved me after that. Uh, I, I don't know if my kids had done stuff like that. I might have killed them. I don't know. Okay, 
But if you really believe uh, that, that this unconditional love, now the concept, the concept of unconditional love is unique to Christianity. You've got to get that. The whole concept of unconditional love is unique to Christianity. There's no other religion in the world where the gods that they worship love you just because you're you. You've got to do something. You've got to build something. You've always got to be doing something. And uh, it's performance. There's nothing to do to earn favor with God. You don't do... Oh, I've heard parents. Now, you better be good or Jesus won't love you. Let me tell you something. I, I said, oh, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't tell that kid that. Don't tell that child that. And, and now, tell kids, well, you better be, you know, uh, he's making a list, he's checking it twice. See, the whole concept... When kids get this idea of Santa Claus is going to bring them gifts, they got to earn them. Well, they ain't gifts. They ain't gifts. Are they? If you earn something, it's not a gift. Okay. Now, so you, you don't do anything to earn favor with God. Appearance, intelligence, performance, out the window. They count zero. If you really believe that God loves you unconditionally, then you have to begin to value yourself. you got to begin to, to value yourself. Okay? Uh, I, I love a little picture I had one time. A little kid said, I know I'm not junk because God don't make no junk. God don't make no junk. Paul said, you know, in that Romans 12, 3 we looked at, and, and this is from the book of Mike, uh, at me. Think your way to a sober estimate of your own self. Think your way to a sober. The word sober there means sane. Sane, real, honest. Think your way to a sober estimate of yourself. Now let's look at some corrective measures. Look more closely at Paul's prescription for repairing a distorted self-image. God's unconditional love is absolutely, positively, the first and the great important step is realizing that. First, of course, is protos, and great is megas. It's the first and the most important step, and sad to say, many Christians today have never taken that first step. They go through their Christian life, and they fret, and they stumble, and they're here, and they're there, and they're looking for something new and something fresh. And i tell you what's new and fresh. Your Bible, every day, every morning, brand new, fresh bread. Oh, I love fresh bread. Gosh, I, when I'm baking bread, I can't hardly go out of the house. I so there, smell that. Yeah? Now, too many Christians haven't taken it. Now, we all have attributes. Uh, about us. We all got things about us. Okay, they're attributes. They're either socially or culturally undesirable. And we are at a total loss as to how to establish a self-worth from within our own self. At the very best, we erect a phony self-image. What's that called? Facade. A phony facade. Uh, and that only leads to more problems. We talked about that facade already. Now, a, fa a facade's not a bad thing. A principal or the front face of a building. I think, I think that ought to be the best looking part of a building, ought to be the front. Okay? And, uh, and now folks up where I grew up, why well, a lot of times it didn't feel that way after reading they had a washing machine on the front porch. Okay? An old man, have you an old man, or have one of those. I remember when mommy got one that I had to crank like that to pull clothes through the ringer. Some of y'all seen one of them, all right? Now, a person has to think and consider the danger of laying aside their worldly facade, phony facade, and putting on a Christianized facade. Now, how you better straighten up and quit that cussing and going on, we're going to church. 
<coughs> y'all look them. Y'all look. There's people like that, okay? And uh, and going to church, and then there, buddy. I'll tell you what. You you expect them to glow just any minute. Hmm. All right. The only sure foundation that we have is to become a new creation in Christ. You're a new creature in Christ. A new, the word creature, the word creature and creation are interchangeable in, in almost all instances. But you're a new creature. You're a new creation in Christ. And you realize and accept the fact that, hey, I'm acceptable to God. I was 17 years old. And God, boy, I tell you, we had a meeting one night, and man, it was rough. Uh, I wasn't able to hold out too very long. And uh, and God accepted me, and I'm thinking, oh, me, me, be, be me, be a church person? You got to be kidding me, okay? And uh, but but God, I was acceptable to Him. And if we need change, you know what God will do. I, I like I like fishing with my boys now. Used to be we go fishing, and, and I do most of the catching, and they do some catching, and then I do all the cleaning. Well, now we go fishing, and we all do catching, and they do the cleaning. <laughs> Hey, Amen. So, so I figured out a long time ago uh, when we're out here witnessing the people, don't worry about all the things about them. You catch them, he'll clean them. You catch them, God clean them. All right. Now, is it not obvious that we got to be acceptable to Him? You know why? You know why I finally figured out I, I was acceptable to God because He made me. He made me, and since He made me. He made me the way He wanted me to be. And, and, and all the time that I was uh, rebelling against God. I mean, I grew up in Sunday school. And, and yet, I was terrible. And, and so, we, when we think about it, God made me my, my looks, my stature. Who can add one cubit to his stature? Nobody. Okay? So God made me the way He wanted me. Now... Consider how God views us. Oh, I love this. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Think about it. When David was called, when others saw a shepherd boy, God saw a king. Hmm. Isn't that something? Develop a realistic self-knowledge. Think your way to that sober, that sane, that honest estimate of yourself. You've got to develop a realistic self-awareness of who and what you are, no matter how painful that might be. Now, a lot of Christians are afraid that if they feel good about themselves, they've committed the sin of pride. Not so. Okay? And the Bible has many admonitions for us to confide in another person. Danger ground here. <clears throat> There's a verse of Scripture that many quote the last few words of it, but they don't always connect the first few. <clears throat> How many times have you quoted this? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. All right, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's in James. But what's the context? Let's look at the entire verse. When you look at James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What are you doing? Confessing your faults one to another. Now, by the way, that don't mean to say, Listen, I've got this problem. Man, I, I just got to have me a little drink once in a while. That's not what he's talking about. Confessing your faults, forgiving them their trespasses. See, God forgive me my trespasses as I forgive those. Who, that's what I'm talking about. Confessing your faults. Brother, we've got a problem and it's my fault. Okay? And you pray about it 
and the relationship and everything about it can be healed. And so it's a sound biblical principle there. Find someone you can really feel comfortable with that you can trust. Ooh. <clears throat> they got to be honest and they got to be confidential. Remember what you say can and be and will be used against you in a court of law. I've said that a few times to a few people, and sure enough, uh, when they came to trial, that's what happened. What they said was held against them in a court of law. Now, the results from a relationship like that can be a real blessing, but you got to be extremely careful that you don't uh, uh, wind up uh, having someone who's bad to, to talk, okay? <clears throat> Another great asset, make your own list. Take your piece of paper, make you a list. You don't have to let anybody else see it. Make you a list of your weaknesses and your strengths. Weaknesses and strengths. Write down. Honest. Keep your paper to yourself. Have the courage to face your imperfections. Everybody's got them. Share those with a trusted friend. <clears throat> Accept the fact that there are parts of your person that you can't change. Can't change. If you're short, you're short. Tall, tall. If, you know, if, if don't matter what. And that goes right back to my nose too big, my ears flop out, whatever. There's things you cannot ever change. Yet some can be turned from liabilities into assets. <clears throat> now, I think I've told y'all about how well I made it through my years in the military by being known as a hillbilly. And I've made it pretty good in preaching and teaching through the years because I'm a Kentucky hillbilly. See, they, nobody don't expect much from me. <laughs> You know, if you don't expect much, I ain't got no high bar to jump over, all right? And, uh, and I, had, I had one old preacher up road told me one time, he said, you know, you say you're from Kentucky. He, that's where he was from as a kid, born in West Virginia, grew up in Kentucky with his grandparents. But he said, I, I, I can't hardly believe you're from Kentucky. He said, you know too much. And <laughs> so I thought right then, yeah, see there, that's working for me. <clears throat> now, major on your strength. Don't worry about your weaknesses so much. There, if there's things, we, we started a Christian school, and I, I searched around for, you know, a program, curriculum, something. Uh, we started a school at our church, and uh, we focused, and we finally settled on, uh, because of our, uh, the small amount of students we had starting out and the small area that we had to work in, we went with the Accelerated Christian Education, ACE program. And basically what it did, uh, instead of being in grade four or grade five or grade six or whatever, uh, you took, you gave diagnostic tests. The kids take a test. And it's just a little quiz thing. And you find out what things they're proficient in and what things they have weaknesses in. Well, don't hold them back on a fourth grade level in geography if they've got it way up here. Go ahead and put them up here in that and down here in that math that they're having to struggle with and try to build that up a little bit, okay? And, and I, I've encouraged my kids. I, I exposed them to things. I bought a piano and put it in the house. Uh, who would have known? I've got one son now that makes a living doing nothing but playing music and singing in the villages. I mean, and, and, and he's doing what he loves. He had some music stores for a while. That was a headache. I mean a headache. But, but now he's doing what he loves. He's doing what he loves. And when you can do what you love to do and make a look. My oldest son is a robotics man. He's been all over the world uh, working on robots and looking at robots. And now he's even building and designing robots. And, and that's really having to travel so much up to Richmond and Pittsburgh. And, and he loves it. He loves it. And, and so... It, you you know you you major on your strengths and use your talents. You got talents, you're born with them, and you got spiritual gifts, you're reborn. You get them. God gives them to you. Find out what they are. People's got spiritual gifts laying idle 
never been used because they won't take a step out and try to discover what those are. God made you to be the way He wanted you to be. Complete self-acceptance. That, that's a must. That's a must. This is the culmination of everything that has come before it. And you've got to come to a complete self-acceptance. You got to accept you as you are like God does. You got to accept you like you are as God. You don't you don't compare yourself with this one, that one, and the other one. Find out what your talents are, what your spiritual gifts are, and use them for God. I promise you a blessing beyond anything you can imagine. What are you going to do about the attributes you can't change? Drop them, forget about it, move on. Realize that failures are to grow by. <clears throat> and don't set unrealistic goals for yourself. Don't set... We live in a goal-oriented society. When, when, I was, uh, when I was in the military, uh, our squadron, we, I, I felt like we could earn the, the efficiency or the excellence patch. And, uh, and worked for over a year at that. I was in the operations department. I worked for over a year, maybe a year and a half at that. And we got that patch. Man, that was so great to put that. I tell you, man, having that on there, it just meant the world. You know, that was, that was wonderful. But, but we could do that. We could do that. And you've got to set goals. Yeah, you've got to have goals, but they've got to be realistic. Now, Right now, I'm not much to do a slam dunk on the basketball court. Uh, unless you got, you're going to go drop that thing down to six, six foot, and then I might barely, it probably hurt my back when I, you know, do my thing there, okay? <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to leave the top of the key uh, like, and do that whirly gig. No, I can't do those things, okay? And, uh, and so don't depend, and depend on the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, let me go through some conclusions. By the way, I lost five minutes uh, uh, about two Wednesday nights ago. I may have to capitalize on that here. I, I promise I'll get you out of here just in a jiffy. People not only have a serious problem with thinking too highly, but also thinking too lowly. Okay? Self-esteem, in its most proper sense, is the right judgment, the right evaluation, and the right rating of one's own self. Most problems encountered with low self-esteem center around intelligence and appearance, sometimes both, either or. Low self-esteem breeds depression and anger, robs us of vitality. Low self-esteem causes us to create a false front, a phony facade, a putting on the dog. You don't know how that works when you ain't got no dog. The major problem with a high self-esteem is that others will rarely, if ever, see you as high as you see yourself. In order to attain a proper self-esteem, one must experience and recognize the unconditional love of God. After a person experiences and recognizes the unconditional love of God, they can develop a realistic self-knowledge that will lead to a complete self-acceptance. All of this development finds its source and strength in the Holy Spirit and being submissive to Him. Practical point. I always like to give one of these. We can never hope to reconcile our inner feelings with circumstance and the actions of others until we discover and totally accept a proper, honest, evaluation of our own selves. Amen? And we won't do it until we do that. Father, as we come to you, Lord, at the close of this session, we have looked at self-esteem and, and rating ourselves and, and being honest and finding our strengths and the things that you would have us do and do them in the way that you made us and the way that you want us. And I ask now, God, that you'll give strength and stamina to those that determine to do this in their own lives. 
because this, Father, is just one of those parts that will put into that assembly and, and, and make this thing come together piece by piece as we begin to understand the different pieces and then we'll start seeing them come together and start understanding how we can actually and really honestly have a biblical love. We got to understand what biblical love is, which we'll get to later. But Father, help us, Lord, to keep our minds steadied upon you, a complete self-acceptance because you have accepted us. And if there's any, if there's a one that is here tonight or one that's watching on, on Facebook Live or will later maybe see this on YouTube or whatever media, I pray, God, that at, the, at that time you'll visit their heart, the Holy Spirit will hover about them and give them an opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ and develop a personal relationship with Him and that He will be their uh, advocate between them and the Almighty God. We love you, Lord. We praise you for all things. In Jesus' name.